We're here at Lane Place, the home of the Montgomery County Historical Society. And uh, we're doing a, one of a series of interviews uh, that uh, have been uh, sponsored by the Montgomery County Historical Society, the American Legion, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, and the Heritage Alliance of Montgomery County. Uh, as everyone knows, this is the 50th anniversary of World War II. Uh, that is the start of World War II. And uh, there are a number of men and women in our in our county or living here now or did live here who had uh, vastly different uh, types of experiences during World War II. Uh, some, some of them uh, grow, grew up in a small town and uh, perhaps had never been outside the county or maybe as far as Indianapolis and suddenly they were thrust into a whole new world of uh, going to Europe and parts of Asia and all over the world. Uh, this, uh, we have been helped in this endeavor by, as I said, the Legion of Veterans of Foreign Wars, uh, particularly uh, Claire Chamberlain of the American Legion and uh, Ed Miller of the Veterans of Foreign Wars, who uh, the latter has been our cameraman a good many times. Today our cameraman is uh, Mike Hall, executive director of the Montgomery County Historical Society. Uh, what do we plan to do with these interviews? Well, we're going to give uh, the original of the tape to the interviewee. We are going to make two copies of the tape and place them in the local history room of, the, Mon of uh, the Crawfordville Public Library where they can be checked out uh, if anyone is interested. Uh, the Montgomery County Historical Society claims copyright uh, ownership of these tapes. Uh, and uh, we're hoping that uh, these people who are being interviewed are going to be telling their story just as they would tell it uh, to their grandchildren. Uh, and uh, by the way, this was inspired by, this, this series was inspired by the recent uh, series done of the Civil War where those uh, veterans of the Battle of Gettysburg assembled uh, at Gettysburg on the 50th anniversary of that battle. All right, now I'm going to start out by interviewing our candidate for the day. Will you give us your name, please? Uh, William R. Hawley. And uh, when were you born, Bill? Uh, July 21st, 1916. And whereabouts? Lima, Ohio. And uh, how did you happen to come to Montgomery County? Well, my roots actually came around Danville, Indiana. My father was born in Kansas, but then he was international harvester, and they were moving him around a lot. And of course, then I married Jane Waller House from Ladoga, and that's how we ended up in Ladoga. And when did you when did you marry? We married in uh, April of 1942. That was the war had already started. Shortly, I was making a grand total of twenty-one dollars a month. All right. Now, um, what did you do before the before the war? Right. To give us your educational background. Well, I got my A.B. from uh, old Central Normal College at Danville. My father had been on faculty for many years, and uh, the depression was on, money was tight. I stayed with my grandmother there and went to college, got my A.B., license to teach physics, chemistry, and mathematics on the high school level. I got no job. The first year, the depression was on. I borrowed $600, went to IU, and got my master's degree and some on my PhD for some of $600. Mm -hmm. And uh, did, did, did you attend the Ladoga schools though? No, no, I never. You I never graduated from high school, South Bend Central. 
So, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, your connection with Lidoga was purely to your wife. Okay, yes. We met in college, and uh, we were engaged for some while. War came along, and we decided to get married. All right. Now, uh, you were a draftee then? Well, technically, yes. I actually went to Chicago and enrolled in the Aviation Cadet Program for Communication Officers, but they said to we'll pull up, it'd be a while. So I was single and teaching in Bremen High School. I came back from there and called the draft board and said, put me on the next name, on the next list. So actually, I worked myself up in the regular Army and Barrage Blues up to a sergeant when they finally caught up with me and sent me to Belleville, Illinois, to Scott Field, the aviation cadet for communication officers. When did you enter? What was the date of your entry into the service? Uh, Valentine's Day, February the 14th, 1942. Henry went to Fort Harrison. All right. Did any other uh, Montgomery County people go with you at that time? Well, I was teaching up in, uh, up in, in uh, Marshall County. Oh, no. No, there were oh. people from up there. In fact, my grandfather went into the Civil War, great-grandfather went into the Civil War from the same county. Huh. Well, now, uh, when you, you went over to Scott Field and uh, uh, did you go through basic training? Or where no, I've gone through basic training in the regular Army down at uh, Paris, Tennessee at Fort Tyson, which was a training place for Coast Artillery Broad Balloons. Uh -huh. when, when did you do that? Well, that's when I did, that's when I went first, uh, when I got into uh, the Army, February the 14th okay. and 42. They sent me to Camp Tyson. All right, uh, then uh, you went to Scott Field. What, uh, tell us about that experience. Well, that was a, a, a good, it was a year program, which was boiled down into about four months, and we graduated as second lieutenants, uh, primarily to take care of the communication work in the, a, fighter, a bomb squadron or a fighter squadron or something like that in the Army Air Corps. Now, when you're talking about communication, was that radio or telephone? Yes, or? radio, telephone, cryptography, uh, taking care of the, the uh, radio equipment in the planes. In other words, an RB-25, if I redlined the plane, regardless, it would not fly until it, the radio equipment was in a number one shape. All right. Uh, how long were you at Scott Field? About four months. And then I was there a little while until they decided to send me, over, send me overseas. And then I uh, left there all about Thanksgiving of 1942. Tell us about uh, how you got, where, where you went overseas and how you got there? Well, we went down to uh, Miami and I saw it was going to be a while before. Did you down there? No, I went by train. We, uh, we were in the Air Corps, but we weren't flyers. But we were going to fly overseas. I called my wife and she came down. We were there about 30 days. On January the 6th of 43, we got into C-47 and flew out of Miami, down through South America. Well, now, we're going to, why don't we just use this map building to uh, show the people where your, your route going overseas. Okay. Well, we started out from Miami, which is right here. We flew down to Puerto Rico and got gas. Flew to Trinidad for the night. Got gas, flew down into South America, crossed the Amazon River and stopped at the town of Belém, B-E-L-E-M, for the night where we had a, I didn't know it, but I did after I got there, we had an American base there. Then they flew us down to the tip of Brazil, which as you see is considerably east of the United States. We flew to Ascension Island. That's where I got my first introduction to the war. One of the fighter pilots was practicing and ran into something and killed himself. We had a funeral that afternoon. The next day we flew on into what was the Gold Coast on Africa. It's now Ghana. They were there two or three days until we got into a, a big a DC-3 with brand new engines, started across Africa, stopped overnight at Lake Chad, went into Khartoum for breakfast, then we flew Crossed 
Well, here, I right took into India at Karachi. That was the end of my flying for a while. Then I took my train, went to New Delhi until we were assigned. And then I got, went down the train to Calcutta and out near Jamsedpur, where the bomb squadron was located. And then I became a communication officer in the 490th bomb squadron. What do they call your outfit? They call it the Skull and Wings or the Burma Bridge Busters because our job was to knock the bridges out of the way of the Japanese that were trying to get in India by way of Burma. Did you ever see any Japanese? Oh yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Most of the, all, the ones I saw were either dead or captive. And I wasn't ground troops. So I did fire my 45 at a tree one time just to see if it worked. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Uh, but we, I did go on, although I wasn't supposed to, I did go on five bombing missions because we were short-handed and I could navigate and work the radio. Where were those bombing missions? Into Burma. And then one time we carried some ammunition into the British in the Imphal Valley when it looked like the Japanese were actually going to get into India. But uh, we kept them out, and I think it was a turning port, at least in the battle with the Japanese. Because yeah. if they had got into India, they would have really had us by the throat. Uh, did you have much contact with the British? Yes, we, we did. Uh, one time we, we were going to move, and we made the Japanese think we were going down to Chittagong, which was on the Bay of Bengal. But, uh, and I went down with some of my men to string up telephone wires and stuff. And, and uh, I, I ate with the British in contact. And then occasionally when we got too bad off, they'd send us up into the Himalayas foothills in northern India for a little rest. And we, of course, lived with the uh, the British up in there. Uh, did they, what about other nationalities? Were there Indians? And yeah, we had uh, some ground troops occasionally, the, the uh, Gurkhas. Uh, of course, we're in Burma, and then we had some ground troops in, in Burma. We actually had some Chinese troops in Burma. When we realized that we had the, uh, the Japanese beaten there, we flew the, Japan, the, uh, flew the uh, Chinese troops back into China. When they got back, they had thrown their sergeant out the window. Thrown their sergeant? Oh, yeah. They what were, do you mean by that? Well, they didn't like him. Uh, they were about 10,000 feet. I imagine he was killed, but we never They found pitched him out of the plane. That pitched him out of the plane, you bet. Would you, were you, did you witness that? Oh, that was no. I don't know that. Uh, they were flying in the, to back into China. I know, our, our squadron and, and our group headquarters and the other uh, squadrons in our group, the 491st and 22nd, eventually got into China. But I, I got home before I left on the last day of 44 and started home, so I missed on that trip into China. Give us your reaction to the to the British uh, and uh, and these other nationalities. Uh, what? Uh, how did you find them? Well, I found the British were very friendly, uh, particularly if you were in the minority or in the majority. Now, if we were, if I was in the minority, which I was down at Chittagong, I was only one officer and all these British officers, uh, I got a little different treatment. Mm -hmm. I, I was an outcast. And when, when we were the majority and one of them came in to us, then we were pretty, we, we were pretty nice people. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it, they, they had no real problem. Did you... Uh, we were on the same side. Yeah. Did you uh, have any, uh, hear anything about Stillwell at that time? Yeah, I met him. Oh, did you? Yeah, one time we flew into uh, Burma with our Colonel McCartan, our commanding officer, and uh, I got to meet him then. Give us your reaction to Stillwell. Great guy. Yeah, he was, he was, uh, he had... Was he revered by the troops, uh, like, uh, he's, well, he seemed I, to read about today? I, as far as I know, I had no personal contact with his own troops, but... And of course, uh, so I can't say, but uh, I see no reason why he shouldn't have been. I mean, he was doing a good job and did a good job. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
What about, uh, what, what did you hear about Chiang Kai-shek? Very little. I mean, I would have if I had gone on into China, but I, I, I think he was on the right side. Uh, the problem was he was not a communist. And of course, the communists, even at that time, were wanting to take over China, and they have. Mm -hmm. uh, now, did, uh, uh, in your travels, did you meet other, did you ever run across other people from, from the, your hometown? No. Well, my problem is I didn't have a hometown. There were five of us kids in the family, and because of Dad's work, uh, we were born in five different towns in three different states. Okay. Dad was in the sales for International Harvester, so I, uh, Danville was the closest I had to a hometown because my grandparents had lived there, and I knew it all my life, but I didn't really, no, I didn't meet anybody. Yeah. I have seen some people around here that I have run into that were in Burma, at the same time I was, but I never saw him over there. No. You, did you ever run across a fellow by the name of Colonel Hellowell? No. You know, he was one of, one of the fellows that was with no. our command and uh, went over there after yeah. after he left us. No, uh, he, no. Uh, now, uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, there was a you were at one end of the runway and the Japanese were at the other end of the runway. Well, I could, sit in my, I could sit in my tent and watch our uh, planes, fighter planes take off and go over and strap the Japanese on the other end of the runway. And, uh, you mean that? We took off we, and landed coming over the Japanese troops. Yeah. Oh, I can't understand. They were that close to you? Was yeah. it one runway? Uh, it doesn't seem like a very healthy situation, but I never found anything about war that was very healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, we lost a lot of, a lot of men. Uh, My roommate had his orders to go home to one more mission. Didn't come back. Uh, uh, did he have a family? No, I don't think that uh, Lieutenant Jewett was ever married. He was, up, he was from up in Wisconsin. He was an awful nice young man, college graduate. Most of our pilots were educated people, but uh, we didn't, as all the people that we lost out of our bomb squad, when we had one funeral, one plane coming back, crashed, and we got the bodies back and had a funeral. But usually they just, uh, I, I, they talk so much about Vietnam and places like that, and we, people are still there. They don't, if you've never been there, you don't realize how wild those countries are. They go down, and it's months before you ever get back. The enemy are there. We don't know what they did, and we never, we, most of them, we never found the bodies. We, don't, we, we had to assume they were dead, you know, crashed in an airplane. So. Mm -hmm. you know, I did have the unfortunate job of going to find the remains of one of our planes. It did come back. A fellow by the name of Moose Mesnick, he played full back. Played fullback for the Fordham Ram football team. He was a pilot, but he wasn't a very smart one. One of our standing rules was that if we never get above the clouds, because our maps were very poor, and if you got above the clouds and you came down, you didn't know whether it was lowland or hills. He came down and hit a solid rock cliff at about 5,000 feet. Killed him, of course, the whole plane. And I had the job to find it. And when I did get there, I didn't find a piece of anybody bigger than your hand. Of course, by that time, several days had passed, and uh, the animals had had their chance. And how, how did you reach? How did you reach there? Did you fly? No, no, no. I you had to go over the jungle trails. Jungle trails up into Shillong, and, and uh, find a guide. And we went down a river ways, and finally got up into the hills and by a path that we ended up walking a good distance. And, but we did locate it. We were sure they were dead. There were no disabled people left and nothing to bury. Mm -hmm. I did find, we did find the uh, Moose Mesnick's uh, chromium plated revolver. We found the jacket of one of the enlisted men that had his name on it, the leather jacket. So yeah. that's, 
that, that was that was the one of the damn down points in my yeah. time. But you had to you had to write it up and tell it like it was, and it was part of the job. Wow. What uh, what would you say was the highlight of your experience in, in the war? Coming home. <laughs> no question about that. Yeah. Coming home. No, I, I, I'm a born-again coward, actually. I was scared from the time I got in until the time I got out, but I don't deny it. Uh -huh. and, uh, it. It wasn't my cup of tea. I, I could have made a lot of money by staying in the Army, but I had no desire to. What, uh, what about uh, the illness and that sort of thing? Did you suffer? Over there, the I didn't. I, I think I was one of the few people that never got dysentery or malaria. Most everybody else had one or the other or both. Uh -huh. I never had. How did you find the medics over there? Were good, they? good. My roommate, after my first roommate was killed, was our flight surgeon, Dr. Wadsworth from Coblesfield, New York, and he was a fine man. I went to visit his widow and his two children. He wasn't married until he got back, but he had ruined his health over there. And uh, he didn't live long after he got married. But I went there. He built a beautiful home near the hospital at Coldskill, New York. And I went to visit his widow and got to meet one of his children. He was fine fellow. Uh -huh. And then we had uh, good nurses. And what did he do? What did he die of? Well, a heart attack, I think, just wore out. Mm -hmm. He was over there. Most of the flying personnel were there for so many missions. Uh, most of the other officers were there a couple of years. Well, he was there from the, he was there when, when we first got there until the war was over. He mm -hmm. just ruined his health. By the way, it might interest you a little bit that our ground troops were on the high sea and we actually were not headed for, for India. We were headed for Java. And while we were out, they were on the high seas, uh, Java was captured by the Japanese, so they switched into mm -hmm. India. And they didn't have, we lived on Russian, or Russian. Might have been better, but we lived on British rations, and they weren't very good. Yeah. The bread, bread came in, in trucks, piled high with loaves of bread, with no wrapping. Oh, my. Uh, lots of rats. Lots of 90 people sitting on them, and lots of flies. And no. We we didn't eat crust. We learned not to eat the crust. Why? <laughs> no. Contaminated were they? Well, even here I don't think you'd want to eat a load of bread that came to your house from Indianapolis on the back end of a truck without any covering, wouldn't you? <laughs> would you eat it? I would. No. And India was not noted for the cleanliness. Some of the things you could see as you went through those million uh, mud villages they had in India. The way they lived, it's a wonder any of them grew to maturity. Mm. Sanitation was nothing that they knew anything about. You've spoken of this uh, medical officer that you admired. Uh, what did you think of the rest of the officers that you dealt with? 99 and uh, 9900 of them were excellent people. I suppose I'd have to find one bad one in the bunch, but I don't remember. Of course, uh, we didn't have much else to do, and I wasn't uh, wasn't much to read. And in the nighttime and the evening, and for payday, there a bunch of us get together and play poker until uh, there wasn't enough people with money left to play. That was our recreation, and uh, see those fellows play poker with them one night, and then they were gone the next day. It was sort of hard to, hard to get used to. Uh -huh. Now. Uh I assume that uh, when you you didn't have children when you were overseas, you got back to uh, the United States. Tell tell us about how. Well, we we were on the boat from Bombay to San Los Angeles about 31 days. We went by the way of Melbourne, Australia, to pick up war brides, and I got a train back to. War brides. <laughs> That's an interesting. Oh yeah. yeah they were uh, the troops that uh, our troops in Australia. Some of them got married and they just, we brought their wives back to this country. And the war was still on. We had an escort most of the way. Uh -huh. And I rode then back to Camp Atterbury on the train. Called my wife. Said I don't want to be in. And uh, 
medic found out that I'd been taking Adamant so I wouldn't get malaria, at least it wouldn't show like I had it. And he always said, you'll have to go to the hospital. So I followed him down the path and went by the headquarters and ducked in and asked if my orders were ready. And they said, yes. I grabbed them and jumped on a bus. As far as I know, that doctor's still waiting for me. <laughs> but I, I kind of doubt it. <laughs> and got into town. We were living in a very nice apartment at 1308 Central, which was very nice in 1945. And, uh, Indianapolis. Uh, Indianapolis. My wife worked for George Olive CPA firm during the war. She quit teaching and went into that. Made a lot more money. And uh, she went home. And uh, that was about 9 or 10 o'clock. She didn't think I'd be there that early. And of course, we sat around and talked a little bit. And I said, how about supper? I didn't get any supper, but uh, she was glad to see me, and I was glad to see her. Now you had children after that. Then, Our first you? boy was born in December of that year. Tell us about uh, your children. What, who well, were of course, the war, I, uh, I went to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina there for a while, and that was a dead-end job. The war was still on. A friend, a former salesman of my father's, was there and he was a lieutenant colonel and I went and asked him what in the world I could do to get out of that place. He said, well, being that you were overseas, you can apply to command general staff school and they can't keep you from going. I said, let's go. So I was out at Leavenworth, Kansas in command general staff school when they dropped the first atomic bomb and then the second atomic bomb and the war ended. And I said, I want to go home. I'm through with the Army. And they said, you're going to stay here until this course is over. So I did. I got home shortly before Thanksgiving. No job. I did have terminal leave until February or January of the next year. But I went in. My wife didn't want me to go back to teaching. She wanted me to get into something else. Actuarial work and, and a, Church company, and I said, No, that's crazy. Me an actuary, no. So I went to the Indianapolis School Board, and the principal the superintendent said, I don't think we have a job. And a fellow by the name of, I don't forget his name right now, I came by, and he was the one who placed teachers. And uh, he said, Well, we got a place out of tech, Arsenal Technical High School. I said, I'll take it, teaching physics. I said, you'll have to give me a little time. I don't have any civilian clothes, and I won't go to teaching in my army uniform. So they gave me until next Monday, and by that time I had one suit. Started teaching, and I was there 22 years. And uh, all ch children were born while we were there. How many children do you have? I had four. What John was the first, and then Dave. Dave's an attorney in Chattanooga, has two children. And then our daughter, Lucy, married with Dennis, who's now at Rochdale, Indiana. And then our youngest one was William. And he's an uh, engineer, works for Newport. For Newport? Mm -hmm. He was right down here. Yeah, he was in charge of building the hot mill when, when they started up. He was one of the first right one hired. First one hired. And our oldest boy, John, wanted to do something for his country, so he dropped out of college and joined the Marines. and. Had his 21st birthday there in Vietnam, and on in April, which seems to be a fateful month for me, my dad died in April. I was married in April, and John died in April. Was he killed? Or? He was killed. You know, killed in action. Buried in the little cemetery. The little over cemetery. Uh, now, uh, Bill, you mentioned that you've. Uh, you go to reunions. Do you hear from any of your old friends in the Well, service? I left Indianapolis in 67, and it was about then or a little before that they'd started making contact, and they couldn't find me for several years. So it was about 10 years before they caught up with me. I've gone to some of them. Uh, last, a year ago, this last March, we dedicated one of our actual B-25s that we used in India and Burma at the Lackland Air Force Base in, in San Antonio, Texas. So I did get down for that. And uh, you might be interested to know that was the first time I got to see my old Master Sergeant who was uh, under me in my communication. And uh, his last name was Spielberg. And yes, he is the father of Stephen Is that right? Well, but uh, uh, Arnold was not married until after the war. He was from Cincinnati. 
And I tried to contact him, but he went to college and got married and had two children. And Stephen and his, he has a daughter that writes for the movies. And Arnold himself was a black mind winner. He has made a, a lot of money himself. Mm -hmm. so, but he's not happy. His wife left him. His son won't even speak to him. So uh, money doesn't do it. That's I don't right. have any money, but I'm happy. <laughs> 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 Anybody that knows me in Indianapolis or India and Crawfordville knows that I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do with yourself now that you're retired? Well, I, I, I built, I got into caning chairs. We had a bunch of them in our house, seven in the dining room. And I caned chairs and, and uh, uh, do wicker and do rice and all types of caning. And uh, I go to a lot of auctions and active in Sons of the American Revolution. And I was active in the American Legion for many years until I moved out to Indianapolis. I was commander of my post and state delegate and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent a lot of spent a lot of time in my church. I wasn't a Christian when I was in in the in Which the church you going? Well, I belonged to the Bible Presbyterian Church. That's where I came to know Christ in Indianapolis. It got absorbed by a bigger denomination, and now I'm in an independent church in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. But uh, oh, I, one thing that I have, I want to cut you off on that, but I noticed it's Captain uh, William Hawley. Yeah. Tell us about your uh, rank and uh, well, I progression. St I started out as a private, twenty-one dollars a month. I became a PFC. Every time my wife would see me, I'd have a different rank. I became a corporal. I became a buck sergeant. And then the uh, then I got to be an aviation cadet. Of course, that was, boy, that was high pay. I got $75 a month in room and board. And uh, then I became a second lieutenant, a first lieutenant, and a captain all while I was in India. And then I became a, a major, and then I was about to become a lieutenant colonel and would have had a nice pension out of the Army, but they got messed up on my job for me to keep my rank up, which was important. And the first thing I know, I was out in the cold. And I, it's all right. I don't, I don't regret it. Mm -hmm. I did my part. Yeah. Well, uh, let's take a little break here and see if we can uh, chat a little bit. We were telling about uh, some incident there where we first got over to India and you were in some situation that wasn't yeah. Well, my first assignment was to the group headquarters of our bomb squadron. And uh, really, uh, we didn't have any bombers to take care of, the radio equipment. I didn't have that. All I had was a radio station and a cryptographic room. And well, it when was, you speak of a cryptographic room, were you, were you, uh, trained in cryptography? Oh yeah. yeah. We had uh, one of the most secret pieces of equipment. You've never heard of it. Nobody's heard of it. They call it a cigar. That was the thing which you... Spell that? Heavens, I don't know. S-I-G-B-A-A, -A, I suppose. It uh -huh. was an initial for something. Anyway, you typed your message. It came up encoded in groups of five letters. When you got it back, you retyped it, and it came out clear. Oh, mm -hmm. And nobody could see it except those that were authorized, not even the commanding officer of the squadron or anybody. Mm -hmm. I could see it, the cryptographers could see it, and that was it. Oh. it was, and, uh, but it wasn't that. I, I wanted a little more than just a group officer, but I saw something that was wrong. Here it was, 100, 110, or 20, 24 hours a day. The degrees, you mean? Oh, yes. Yeah, a good old Fahrenheit degrees. And, uh, these fellows got these messages, they had to take them to headquarters, which was two, two and a half miles away, and they had to walk in that heat. And I thought that just wasn't quite right. And I said, the next time you get a message, you give it to me and I'll take it to headquarters. So I did, and of course the colonel wasn't in. Here I was just a second lieutenant, brand new, and uh, they said he's over in the mess hall, which was dark and a little cooler. I thought somebody else was there, but I couldn't tell who it was. And I told him what was happening. These men were having to walk that distance with the message, and I said that they shouldn't do it. They should have transportation. 
And I said, for your information, this is your last message, and started to walk out. And then he introduced me to the man that was there, was the full colonel in the inspector general's office. Needless to say, we had our transportation later that day. And I thought I had uh, cut my own throat, but it turned out that honesty and, and, and telling the truth was, does pay. Now, another point that uh, Mike has just mentioned here, you're, you're bombing the... Uh, oh, yeah. Let's, let's cover that. Well, I wasn't supposed to fly. I didn't get paid extra like the pilots and so forth did. But we were short. I could navigate and I could run the radio, so uh, that would save one person on a trip. And we had, for a while there, had to carry ammunition to some British in the Impal Valley. So we weren't actually dropping bombs, so they didn't need a bombardier. We were flying over enemy lines, however, and uh, we started down the runway with a brand new pilot that just out of the States. And he looked at me and he said, I don't think we're going to make it. And I said, you're going to make it. I reached down and pulled the wheels out from under him, and that gave him enough airspeed that we got off. And we got our, delivered our stuff and came back. Two days later, he ran into the top of a hill, and that killed him and the whole pilot. But I've always regretted that I didn't press the point with the colonel that he was really not confident that he and two other people got killed as a result. But my negligence, actually, I would say. Now, you were the bridge busters. We did were the murmur bridge busters. Did you bust any bridges? No, I didn't get actually on a big bridge busting maneuver, no. But uh, we did. I mean, and we, I, I was always in on every briefing as a communication officer to give them their uh, code that they could radio back if they had need for anything that we could do and give them instructions on things like that. And one thing that our, one of our officers always told them, which way to go when they left the target. And I remember one in particular that was clear over on the other side of Burma, along the river, with mountains on both sides. And they said, hit the bridge, turn right. If you turn right, you'll get in trouble. We had one fellow that was a very, he didn't always believe everything he told him. He turned left. That was his last trip. They said he turned upside down, went right in the middle of the river. Mm -hmm. Shot him down. Yeah. So that's, uh, I, I learned something from that. Did day. you ever, were you, were you ever subject to any enemy fire? No. Well, we got bombed once or twice. But then, that day, the crazy Japanese bomber went down the wrong side of the runway. I had a, a, a boy from Brooklyn who was my supply sergeant in Burma after we moved over there and they bombed the other side of the runway and up till then I had trouble getting him to put sandbags around where he kept our spare tubes and things like that for getting the radar. Believe it, after that bomb run that morning, he worked all night getting sandbags around his supply tent. <laughs> so a few bombs will make a believer out of most anybody. Yeah. No, I, 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 I was uh, running a business and I was pretty much very impersonal in the Air Corps because you, the bombing is way over there, you know. But then we were lucky that they didn't get us too often. What did you do with all those Japanese prisoners? I, I don't want to do them. That wasn't my department. Did you see any of them? Yes, I saw a few in the Impal Valley area. Mm -hmm. They were big. They weren't little fellows. They, they were a big tribe. They were tall, taller than I am considerable. Uh -huh. yeah. They always think of the Japanese. Oh, I know, but you've seen these sumo wrestlers or whatever they call them. Mm -hmm. They're big this way and that way too. They're, they're, mm -hmm. they're big men. Yeah. And this happened to be, I don't know what part of Japan they were from, but they were big. Yeah. Well, Bill, this has been very interesting and uh, we sure do want to thank you. Yeah. Well, I hope come somebody come else gets some good out of it. Well, we're going to 50 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what good we'll do now, yeah. but we'll sure have the record of it. Well, after you called me, I thought I ought to really just sit down and or maybe my children would. This may inspire me just to type it up so that they yeah. don't have it. To well, see. this tape's going to be available to them. It's, so it's mild compared to most people that were in the war. Like my son that died, I mean, he was, he saw, uh, well, 
Right, hand to hand. I mean, it yeah. was, he was in a Marine, and it's a different organization. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Ben.